Courtney, I come from the Accenture Forte group. Um, we're so happy to have you all here with us tonight. Um, it's going to be a really exciting evening. Um, just before I pass you on to Phil from the Agile Roundabout, a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, if you need to go to the bathroom, we've got two sets of toilets on your left hand shoulder. Um, and if we have an emergency, which fingers crossed we won't, the emergency exit is on your right. So I hope you have a nice evening. Um, we'll be floating around if you have any questions. Um, thanks again for coming, and I'll pass you on to Phil. Thanks. <laughs> um, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Phil from TRG. I run a software engineering and agile recruitment business. Um, about nine months, Rob and I decided that we were going to set up the Agile Roundabout as a way kind of to give something back to the community. We were hearing a lot of similar stories across industry and I thought it would be worthwhile setting up something where people can share those. Um, tonight we're very lucky to have um, three great speakers from two organisations. We've got Sean from Equal Experts. Um, we've known Equal Experts for a while. They provide um, very elegant and simple solutions for some quite <coughs> complex business problems. Um, and also we have uh, Will Perkins and Charlie Wilkinson from River Island who are on a um, very interesting technology journey of their own. So um, hopefully it's going to be really interesting. And um, yeah, thanks very much again to Courtney and Lorraine and uh, Wynap for um, letting us use this good space. And um, I'll pass you over now to Sean, who's going to give you his talk. Thanks. Uh, you know, that can help. 
So let's get back to that starting point. Starting point is, how well is your code tested? This is what you call a qualitative measure. Because well is like sort of <clears throat> continuous and not very discreet and maybe even emotional and there's multiple axes to, uh, to compare it on. It's a qualitative measure and computers don't do qualitative measures. Computers do quantitative measures, things with numbers and comparisons and maths and stuff. So <clears throat> is there a way we can take this question and modify it a bit so that it becomes a quantitative measure? And then we can usefully answer it with computer. Because right now, how well is my code tested is kind of like, does my website look good? Which is a really important question. But who here has had any success writing a computer? Who, who thinks they could write a computer program to tell you if your website looks good? Yeah, no answer. So, a quantitative, a, a quantitative measure. Sorry, quantitative is one of those words that's different in North America. <clears throat> so I might screw it up. Um, Quantitative measure. So here's one. How many lines of code can I delete without causing a test to fail? And the usual caveat emptor applies here. Lines might be statements or methods or branches, and if it doesn't compile, the tests fail, obviously. <clears throat> so this is one measure. It's not the only one. Um, another one is can I change a statement without making a test fail? Um, I use that one sometimes. Um, if any of you ever submit an offline code review to Equal Experts, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but there's a phase when we mark that where we replace um, string constants in the code with the word giraffe and see if everything still passes. And if it does, we yell at you. Um, but how many lines of code can I delete without causing a test to fail? That's a decent measure. Now, why is it a decent measure? Well, it's a pretty direct translation of the qualitative question. If I can delete a whole bunch of my code without causing my tests to fail, then my tests probably aren't testing that code. In fact, they're definitely not testing that code. It makes sense, but the third one's the key, because it minimizes the code that's written for the set of tests. And one of the important things about TDD is that it prevents goal plating. <clears throat> and so this helps. If you've written more stuff than you need to build the app, you might be using WebSphere. And uh, you should not do it either way. So this would be a really good measure. And in a perfect world, this would be a great way for code coverage engines. So we're just sort of delete lines at random, and if the tests still pass, complain. And nobody does this. Can anybody guess why? Because it's expensive. Really, really, really expensive. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to show you a sample bit of Java later on in this presentation. It's got something like 23 statements that you could potentially uh, remove. And that's excluding things like import statements and throw clauses, which is 23 statements. And if I was to use this method, I would have to perform 506 build and test cycles, which I'm not going to do because these guys have to present in like 20 minutes. And I don't have that kind of time. So that's what we want to do. But the truth is, we can't. We can't afford to. So, what to do instead? <laughs> we cheap out. Or, to translate that into professional speak, like everybody in the office is always telling me to do, we find a lower cost approximation. So, we need a quantitative measure on a budget. So, instead of how many lines of code can I delete and still having all my test pass, that gets changed to how many lines of code are executed statements, methods, branches, when all of the tests are run <coughs> instead. So, this is not as good, <coughs> but it's cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. One test run is slightly slower than normal because the code has been instrumented instead of potentially hundreds or thousands of test runs whenever you change something. <coughs> and it's approximately the same thing. But we've got one of these little asterisks there. Because all of the fun happens in the word approximately. <clears throat> so, at first glance, they would seem to be almost exactly the same thing. <clears throat> but they're not. Anybody off the top of your head, can anyone uh, just raise your hand or shout out, have any suggestions as to when they might be different? 
there's, there's an extra bit of information when you delete something that still runs or not. What we can get is this. Well, a little bit of that, but like some, some, some examples of something that if you deleted it, it wouldn't run, but it doesn't get executed during a regular test run. Like, so that's sort of the difference. There's a, a hand over here as well. What do you got? Right idea? The fact is, if the line was run, it doesn't mean that you verified that the code is doing what it should be. With that well, yeah, that's sort of besides the point. If you can delete the code without making a test fail, you're also not doing that. But some examples of things are, um, <clears throat> who's ever had to put a, uh, a try-catch block into the code to keep the compiler happy? Anyone? A couple of people. Um, anyone ever have to write, uh, anyone have a class with all static methods? Helper class sometimes? A couple of those. You guys instructor on that class? Yeah, like uh, a private constructor to make sure the class never gets instantiated because it's only got static methods. <laughs> so something that never, ever, ever runs, right? So that's there, it's there for a reason. And <clears throat> your code would break in a way if it wasn't there, but it doesn't get executed. So stuff like that tends to cause real problems. And here is a real world example. <coughs> in a real world example, I did something I kind of copied and changed so it's not um, you know, not sensitive. So, the class, first of all, up here, is complaining on line 13. And that is because this class has only static methods, <coughs> and the JVM generates a default no argument constructor. So this isn't even like a line that I can delete. It's just there because the compiler puts it in, um, and it's only static methods. It never gets run. It shouldn't get run. If you write a test, that constructs an instance of this class just to exercise that constructor, you are a fool. <clears throat> um, this catch exception on line 18 and 19, every, every, every JVM ever, well maybe not next year because of last week, but every JVM ever has SHA1, the message digest value in it. It's the rules. It can't call itself Java if it doesn't. So that will never, ever not be there. The compiler is all that, so you have to catch the stupid block with you know, something like an assertion error or a throwing error. That will never, ever get thrown. And if I delete it, it won't compile, my code coverage engine complains. <clears throat> then down here, I've got you know, my no output stream extends the output stream. I've got a method that has to be there to extend the output stream, but it never gets executed. And it's, you know, when you've got comments like do nothing or ignore this or just catch this exception, those are, those are usually the times. But did anybody spot the other one? Anybody? Okay, let's see. What about this line right here on line 23? Anybody see that? Uh, I wonder what that is. <laughs> it's a really stupid method that I put in to make a good example. It does something really dumb, and then it throws away the result. <clears throat> and this is a classic example. If I deleted this method, and deleted its calls, nothing bad would happen, and no test would fail, by definition, because it's nothing but a side effect. <clears throat> and a good code is covered. The expensive code coverage method will catch this, and your cheap one will miss it, and you're stuck there, it just doesn't need to be there, and it's not going to find it. So that's really what I'm talking about. And you can see how the one method keeps you a bit more honest than the other method. So, problem areas. Synthetic methods. Everybody know what synthetic methods are? Okay. Things that the, the, the compiler puts in to keep you handy, like a, you know, in value methods and things. Um, things you need to make it compile. In general, if it was a feature that was introduced in Java 7, it would probably break your code coverage engine. ARM blocks, automated resource management blocks, are a classic example of that. Because they don't have one branch, it probably puts in about six. Um, just for trivia's sake, it turns out that <clears throat> An ARM block does null checks even if it knows that the answer can't possibly be null because the people that were generating it says, oh, it's no problem, the JIT optimizes that away, which it does. Nobody cares that they're there, except for your code coverage engine, which just throws a giant tantrum. Um, and as we just saw, 
useless code. There are no co code coverage tools, they call themselves code coverage tools, on the market that I know of that even attempt to detect useless code. But in a way, it's the most important thing you can use help with. It. So, thanks. They're all flawed. Some of them are really, really, really flawed. But the bottom point is the one I'd like you all to take away if you can. In that example, the spurious method, the fake method in there, code coverage was 83%. I counted it. When I delete it and prove everything, but deleting a method that doesn't do anything, it isn't covered by any test, or isn't mentioned by any test, doesn't affect any test, when I delete that bogus code, code coverage drops from 83% to 69%. <clears throat> that is actually one of the biggest implications of using code coverage in the real world. Because of situations like that, you cannot reliably enforce either of those two rules, with one exception. <clears throat> you can't say coverage always goes up because somebody could refactor some code and get to useless things and make it smaller and reduce duplication and your test coverage can go down. You can't say it's got to be at least 85%, you can go from 86% to 84% the same way. So you can't do anything about that, unless the coverage level is 100%. <clears throat> if it's 100% and you delete some untested code, it's still 100% because everything that's there is still covered. <clears throat> now, most people here have probably heard someone complain about 100% as an unrealistic standard. <clears throat> and you're probably right most of the time. So you can't use, what this means is that if you're using code coverage enforcement with like a tool like Sonar or something, or code coverage <coughs> enforcement as part of your build, um, sooner or later, you can't guarantee that it won't do something wrong on you. And this is why probably people in this room have had a conversation with code coverage that they didn't really want to have, even if they were doing the right thing. So, what do you do instead? <clears throat> what I like doing is spot check. So on my projects, <clears throat> I don't enforce it as part of the build. I will either run, run code coverage regularly as part of the build and keep a look at sort of the long-term trends but ignore short-term dips. <clears throat> or I will, if the coverage is high enough and the gaps are low enough, <clears throat> keep kind of a mental catalog of the places it's not covered and the small enough code base just kind of have that in my head and check them out every couple of weeks to make sure that it's still sort of what I think about. Or, as a colleague of mine named Steve says, don't use the data as data, use the data as a starting point for a conversation with someone. Is this, you know, the coverage go down because we did something good, the coverage ends to the flip, the coverage go down because we forgot to test something, and you just sort of use it as an emergency check. <clears throat> Compared to last week, not the last commit, you know why it goes down. One thing you can do is with the right build system in a larger project, especially if you're on a brownfield project that you're cleaning up and improving the tests on over time, separate these silos of completely tested code and completely untested code. Just keep them in different, different source trees in the same project. If you're using something like Gradle, compile them together <clears throat> and just split them. And then, once you have an area that is completely tested and can be completely tested nicely, enforce on a 100% rule. But that's really the only rule that's ever worth enforcing. So, two more things. One is the question everybody asks me whenever I give this talk. Should I test getters and steps? Of course not. <laughs> unless they do something like non trivial <laughs> But, delete ones that aren't called. Delete ones that uh, you can delete without making a test fail. <clears throat> I'm a big fan, I'm an intelligent user myself, so I you know, uh, always watch when it declares a highlight, this code isn't called. Um, you can always create them later. There's no sense creating them early. Um, just create them as they're needed. You refactor and continue. Regularly refactor. Don't create them early because you'll know you need them and you'll be wrong. Now, 
The second one, should I enforce 100% code coverage? And the answer to that is it depends. And the real answer to that is most of the time you probably shouldn't. But twice in my long and reprehensible career, I've been on teams where we were kind of pretty close to it. Um, the last time was maybe in 2013. And like I was describing, we did spot checks sort of every week, every two weeks, and we had sort of a usual group of suspects. Um, four, maybe six sort of places where things were never covered and it was okay not to cover them. And once I had a little bit of extra time and we put in some explicit tests of the kind that normally you wouldn't write, like constructing a class that doesn't have any instance methods just to satisfy things, just to see if we could get out of 200%. We could. Um, a week later, we were still at 100%. So I chatted with some of the people on the team, and um, we just sort of had a conversation about it. Like, not an imposition, but a bunch of us were like, should we actually try making this build, um, build, build fail if it's not 100%? And no one was really sure, but we kind of decided to try it and see what happens. Because we had been like 98, 99 for a while. So we turned it on, and we forgot about it. And maybe three weeks later, the build broke, somebody committed something, code coverage had gone down from 100% to 99%. And the person on the team looked at it and went, oh yeah, no, I totally forgot to put a test there. And we wouldn't have spotted it without the test. So we decided to keep it, and you know, it was just sort of mostly there, it wasn't a big deal, but the, like, the first three or four times we triggered it, it was something we had forgotten, and it was reminding us and helpful to us, so we decided to keep it. And then the only other really time it came up was, you know, the client we were working for, there was a management change, and someone from a different division came in, and they were, um, they were sort of asking us about our, our quality of our code, and, you know, how good the application was. And so they, you know, they asked the usual questions, and someone sort of went, well, what's your test coverage? <laughs> I have no idea how good it feels to, without even looking, just go, oh, it's 100%. And when someone asks you how you know, you just go, oh, well, we can figure the build to fail, and very, very smart. <laughs> so, it depends on why you're doing it, if you're doing it because you think it's helpful for you versus if you're doing it because someone's boss's boss has decided to impose this rule. It depends who decides. If the team decides for themselves, I believe it can be a good thing. And if it doesn't feel like work, if it feels helpful, I think that's a good thing. If it's just there to tick a box or because someone's imposing on you, it's probably the wrong thing. But it has occasionally been the right level of tolerance for you before. So that's what I've got on uh, code coverage. Anybody have any questions? Yeah? Is it for all the classes or deletes on lines Really large code base, 
you're going to run into the, there's no way you can perform all of the mutations at once sort of thing. So it probably works a bit better if you start from nothing and every time you add a line it, it, it checks that it can delete it and then sort of maintains it over time. I don't think they're perfect, but it sounds like a mutation test sounds like a pretty decent um, approximation for this or another, another way to tackle the problem. Do yeah. you have a question? Uh, just oh. the same question. Cool. Yeah. Do you think that's a big, let's say, a standard for code coverage? Is a sort of a lot of risk of encouraging potentially poor quality tests? Absolutely. So, I mean, related to all those rules, is that I can't think of a time I've ever set a standard, set a number. So, I've set um, you know, equal experts we tend to set very high standards for quality of test and very high standards for, you know, performing test-driven development correctly and properly, and that tends to result in very high coverage numbers. But I can't think of a time we've looked at this and said this number isn't high enough, because you're probably exactly right. And in practice, what happens with, to be honest, Cylinder is not one of my favorite pieces of software. And the reason is, Psychology-wise, what you measure is what you improve. So if you measure the test coverage, not value delivered or money made by the company or you know time to ship or defects reported in production or anything like that, but if you measure code coverage, people will make that number go up. But realistically, they'll make that number go up at any cost and sort of just that number, not the related things that you think are going to come up with. That necessarily Almost certainly. For example, in a related, uh, you know, related uh, sort of thing, if you pay people or tie people's bonuses to the number of bugs discovered, <laughs> they write crappy codes so that they can discover the bugs. It's been proven many, many times. So be very careful about what you measure. And this is why I hate sonar because sonar measures everything. <laughs> it reports everything, and so it just sort of scatters off random improvements. It's not a good way to focus the team on something. So, but the answer is, yeah, uh, picking a number is a bad thing to do. <clears throat> I've never seen a number, and I wouldn't really know why exactly 84% is magically better than 83%. <coughs> Good code tends to have high numbers. <clears throat> In my experience, 
what is it, sort of between two and three to one is a good ratio. So if you have 10,000 miles of production code, somewhere between, well, maybe between one and a half and two and a half, sort of between 15,000 and 25,000 lines of unit test and acceptance test code that's as well factored as the production code is, is a decent ratio. If you have 10,000 lines of production code and 4,000 lines of test code, that's not so good. If you have 10,000 lines of production code and 100,000 lines of test code, that's not so good either. <clears throat> so that's, that's an, another ratio or another metric you may want to use, and it's nice because it covers sort of over-covering, uh, which tends to be some very brittle tests, tests that are poorly factored, tests that will just break as soon as you touch anything. Um, where were we? We were talking about sort of um, just sort of counting, counting the numbers. So <clears throat> the problem with that, well, I mean, so the one difference is if you delete code that doesn't do anything, well, actually, it's kind of the same thing, right? Because if you, delete, if you add a bunch of code that doesn't do anything, that number doesn't go up. And in fact, that number would have gone down as a ratio to your total code base, right? So if I accidentally add a class that I forget to call, <clears throat> nothing really happens. So it has sort of the same flaws. It's maybe a bit better, but really it's sort of when you start looking at them, you know what the rough areas are. It, it's sort of a know your code thing as opposed to focus on the code thing. Yeah? You mentioned a little bit of book coverage, but is there other analytics like the cyclomatic factory and things like that? Is there any value in books? So there is some value in cyclomatic code complexity. Um, it suffers from the same sorts of problems at the sonar suite level, right? Which is that people will start doing ridiculous things to make it work. Um, I can show you afterwards, I don't have it on the slide, I can show you an example of decent code that doesn't, that has a lot of branches in it and has a very, very high cyclomatic complexity that doesn't, actually, actually maybe I can describe it, but this might not work. Um, if you've got a bunch, if you're transferring the contents of one bean into another bean, and you go sort of, sort of if bean A dot first name doesn't equal null, bean B dot set, bean B dot set first name, B A, bean A dot first name, if you do that with first name and last name and address and postcode and anything else, and if you've written or generated a very simple sort of property to property copier, copier that only um, <clears throat> performs the copy if the field's not null, those null checks, that, uh, any method like that will end up having a cyclomatic complexity of like 50 or 75 or a couple of hundred really, really quickly. But really it doesn't because the gifts don't depend on each other. So it's an okay measure, I guess, but like all okay measures, you can come up with fairly trivial examples that, that make it seem like nonsense. But the bigger problem is, is that you can have low complexity code without it really being good code because it's sort of it's sort of cheap to calculate, cheap to find a path through. I mean, honestly, it would be the same advice, right? If you find methods or classes with really high complexity, take a look at them know why they have that high complexity, and know that they have either for a reason, or because it's you know one of those examples that fools the test, or, oh yeah, this is on our list that maybe we should be right. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Oh wait, yeah. Uh, well, uh, all our best metrics, uh, uh, so ratio of test code to production code yeah. is probably, I, I would say that's a better measure. Metric. And in part it's a better metric because it can be both too low and too high. Um, it's still not perfect because you could have a two and a half to one ratio of just horrible tests that don't test anything. But um, if it's well factored and you know that the tests are good for other reasons, it can sort of give you a measure of, oh, is this tested well compared to the industry average or tested less well? But um, other than that, you know, so it, it, it's a better a better average. Um, things like leak time, um, how often the build is broken, recovery time when the build is broken, those are sort of metrics that have real impact on your team, so they're not so much metrics as actual measure. The best one is always is since we started developing this software, does the company make more money? <laughs> but that can be <coughs> kind of in a way. It's like it's the ultimate metric. Um, it can be kind of hard in a large company especially to actually attribute that right down to the code, but I mean, that's sort of the agile principle, right? Like if, um, if we make money doing this, if we deliver value, 
Um, and money is a decent proxy for value. It's delivering value if you go back to the manifesto is what it's all about. So metrics that are closer to value. 